Hi, I'm Mel Majoros. I am a five-year cancer survivor. My blog, The Cancer Warrior, is one of the top 10 breast cancer blogs, according to blogs.com. I'm here to bring a fresh, upbeat perspective to a topic that to some may seem scary. A positive mental attitude got me through my cancer, and I hope to share that with you. So super excited today. Um, I've listened to our guest when I lived in Southern California. It's JT the Brick, John Turner. He wrote a book called The Handoff. And, um, you know, it's basically for anyone who's touched by cancer and who also is a sports fan. And uh, how are you today, JT? I am great. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. Like I said, I've, I've listened to you in uh, California, and I'm, I'm sure you hear, uh, you know, I'm not one of the clones. I, I, you know, I never knew the backstory about how you got into radio because I never listened to uh, Jim Rome or anything like that. But, you know, this book that you wrote, The Handoff, about your good friend Andrew is just, uh, it's touching and amazing. And as a cancer survivor myself, I could see some of the things that Andrew was uh, going through as far as being a survivor, trying to keep uh, <clears throat> you as a caregiver upbeat. But before we get into that, uh, for the people who don't know who you are, which is probably a small uh, minority, tell us a little bit about uh, your getting into uh, sports radio. Well, I was a stockbroker. I grew up in Long Island, New York, and I grew up my whole life as a diehard sports fan, and I love sports. And I went to college in upstate New York and at a school by the name of Geneseo State University. And I was the president of my fraternity. I loved being around my friends. I loved being around my friends as a kid. I was an only son. I had two younger sisters. And I noticed at an early stage of my life, I was gravitating to my buddies and friends. And that was what happened at college. And then when I graduated college, I ended up becoming a stockbroker. I trained to be a stockbroker because back in 1987, when I graduated college, that's when it was the Wild West of Wall Street. Oh, where yeah. any, any kid that graduated college could go down there. If you passed your Series 6 and Series 63 license, you can become a stockbroker. And I did that. And I was very successful very early in my career. I made a good career early making cold calls and getting people to invest with me. And I did that for a number of years until I got very burnt out on it. It was a tough lifestyle. Tremendous hours, a lot of partying, a lot of late nights, and I didn't want to do that anymore. So I moved with my best friend, a guy by the name of Jim Baxter. We moved cross country, and we ended up in California in San Diego. And at that point, I started stockbrokering again, and I was running out of time and running out of money. I just didn't want to do that anymore. And I became addicted to calling into sports talk radio shows. And I found the Jim Rome show, which at the time was an explosive, hard-hitting sports talk show and I became one of the regular callers and then I won his first ever caller contest called the smack off which was the equivalent of American Idol today for singers <laughs> the smack off is what basically American Idol was to sports talk radio and when I won that contest a door opened for me and I walked through that door and I became a sports talk radio host and I've been doing it ever since for 17 years and I host the largest syndicated sports talk radio show at night for Fox Sports Radio. I'm on over 250 stations all over the country, and I'm living the dream. I love my job, and I love the opportunity it's given me. And, you know, the amazing thing about your story is you, your story, you could be anybody. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, yeah, anybody, anybody who had the, the opportunity to understand what fate meant. You know, I had a lot of great moments in my life where one door closed and another door opened, and I was just one of the guys who walked through that door. I was lucky that when my dad and mom brought me up, I wasn't scared or intimidated about opportunities or failure. And that helped me, as we'll get to it later on, with the battle with cancer with my mentor, is that you have to, you have to be brave at times. You have to be able to be there for friends. You have to be able to step up when your time is called on. And my youth and my background put me in a position. It helped me become the guy that I was when my mentor, Andrew Ashwood, called on me and asked me to try to help him fight back cancer because winning was the only option. I know, and, it, and it's hard, especially when somebody drops that bomb on you. Oh, yeah, by the way, I have cancer, and especially pancreatic cancer, which is one of the um, well most fatal uh, cancer cancers out there. But I think reading your book, The Handoff, all of your, your friendships with Andrew and the first uh, that book that he gave you, um, what did yeah, you... he gave me his playbook. His early playbook. In his, 
Early in my career when I started off, in about 1997, Andrew called me one night. He was my program director in Miami. I never met him, didn't know who he was, and he called and he reached out to me. And he told me he had a playbook, which was the do's and don'ts of sports radio. And he said, read this and get back to me. And that started the beginning of some dialogue and a friendship. And that friendship exploded into a brotherhood. And right at the pinnacle of Andrew's career, where not only was he a program director, but he got the biggest job of his life, which was to run Fox Sports Radio. This was one of my best friends, and he became my boss. And right at the pinnacle of all of this for him, he just got married at the age of 49. He got the best job of his life. He was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And what makes it interesting is they misdiagnosed him. They originally diagnosed him with pancreatic cancer, mm -hmm. and then they came back after further tests and told him that he had a rare form of esophageal stomach cancer, which was just as brutal as the pancreatic cancer. But that's how this friendship grew, because Andrew was my boss. He was my mentor. But our relationship started to fray, because when, when you work for your best friend, yes. <laughs> it's not as good as it looks on paper. And you know, Andrew ended up getting married. He didn't invite me to his wedding. Our friendship was kind of splintering. But as soon as he came back from his wedding and was diagnosed with cancer, he picked me to be his chemo partner because he knew I'd be able to step up for him. But isn't it amazing, like, like you were saying, your, his playbook and your friendship basically was, I think, the foundation for, him, for you becoming his caregiver. Like looking back now, I, I read the book last night. I just feel like, wow, his playbook and then all of your friendship and everything. I mean, just think he could have picked anybody to help him out, but he picked you. Because yeah. he, he knew that you, you know, your tenacity with getting uh, the smack off and, and basically when they said, wait, wait for the first wave. You know, you never want to get hired right away. That I'd, I'd really like that for the spot, Fox Sports Radio. It's like, no, you don't want to be the first people because then they fire everybody who they first hired and then you're in the second wave. So, you know, you knew. I, I, think, I think your friendship was destiny, like you said, like fate along with everything else uh, that has happened to you. Yeah, I think, I think that's great that you picked that up in the book, because that's the message in the book, is about friendship and loyalty. And Andrew and I had this really deep friendship. And I think he picked me for a lot of reasons to be a chemo partner. He had other people. He had a great wife mm -hmm. who was there for him, and she was the primary caregiver. But he understood that because I work nights, I work late nights, that I would be available during the day. And I'd have the energy to take him to the chemo sessions and take him to the hospital when he needed to. And I was fortunate enough that he selected me. Remember, what was key about the handoff, the book, mm -hmm. is what he handed off to me. And if he didn't pick me to be a part of his journey, not only would our friendship, and I would have loved him either way, but our friendship wouldn't have evolved to even a higher level. In a very bizarre way, <laughs> cancer brought us together and made our friendship even better. I wish he never had cancer, mm -hmm. and if we never talked again, but it kept him here, I would trade that in a second. But once he was diagnosed, and he knew that I would be there to help him, and I would step up for him, it brought us to, uh, to a level where we were closer. And the key to the book, the number one message in the book, was that when he told me he had cancer and he needed my help and he wanted me to help him, we never once talked about our problems of the past. We never, mm -hmm. ever talked about it. And I think that's the number one message in the book, that if you haven't talked to a member of your family or a friend or someone for years because you had a falling out or things weren't right, forget about it. Drop all of that and get the relationship back to where it was at its best point. Oh, definitely. I mean, sorry, sometimes I get chemo brain and it, my brain just stops working. Is That probably happened with Andrew a lot. Um, Exactly. I think a lot of people don't understand, like, when Andrew had cancer, I'm sure he had some friends who were kind of freaked out, and they might have fallen by the wayside. Did he have Yeah, any? I don't know if I'd go that far. I think that what happened with Andrew was mm -hmm. he had a lot of great friends, and he had right. a lot of people like myself that he mentored, mm -hmm. and he had great family, and he had great support, and everybody wanted to step up and help to the point where everybody wanted information. And I think one of the reasons why Andrew wanted me part of his primary team was he knew that I would be able to communicate to all of his friends that couldn't be there. I was going to be the guy that if Andrew had a rough day or a good day, I'd be able to get on the phone right. and tell people, hey, Andrew's not available to talk today, but this is what happened. 
and he used me as a guy in a positive way. He wanted me to communicate for him to a lot of his core best friends who couldn't be there because they lived on the other side of the country or they had lives with their families. And he knew that I would be pretty good at communicating to people about how he was doing from time to time. And I, and I think that's very important because I remember having to relay the story of when I was diagnosed about four or five, six times. And afterwards, I was just like, I can't, I don't want to talk about it anymore. And I'm sure that was very, uh, that kind of thing would be tiring for anybody, especially a cancer survivor. But, you know, you were able to talk about it. And also one of the other important things is be there during uh, doctor appointments because sometimes you need another person because I'm sure Andrew was like, cancer, oh, my God. And sometimes you just hear the doctor's voice sounding like the peanuts. Adults, you know, wah, 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 wah. So it's always good to have somebody else there in the room to help you sort out all the information and medical uh, that's a basically great point jibber jabber that's going on. Yeah, that's a great point, because that was one of the key things that I did. You know, being a jibber jabber, loud sports talk radio host, a <laughs> lot of times we don't listen as much as we should. We're talking to people. Yes. And this process of being a chemo partner helped me listen and become more patient and you nailed it. That's exactly what I did on a lot of these chemo appointments, that I'd be in the room, and I would just listen to what the doctors were saying, or I would just follow and watch what Andrew was doing. And with my co-author, Alan Eisenstock, who was the ghostwriter for the book, when we were writing this book, I thought Alan nailed it by the way I sat back and watched Andrew interact with other cancer patients and especially the staff, and you know this. Oh, yes. The staff is unbelievable. The women and men who work in the waiting room, uh, those who administer chemo, uh, those who encourage you every day, the doctors. I mean, they live with cancer their entire time once they walk on property and even when they go home. And what I witnessed with Andrew, whenever he showed up at chemo, he flipped the switch. It was almost like a television camera was pointed at him. And he knew once he walked into City of Hope to concentrate on making other people comfortable, he was truly incredible at that. And, and I think that's important as, you know, that's, well, that was part of his job in radio. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that you bring to the table when, you, when you're facing any adversity. Like, for example, I never thought that I would be on the radio I always thought I'd be a wallflower, but once I got cancer, I felt that I had to share people's stories like yours uh, with others and try to help people that, you know, I've, there are people who listen to this radio broadcast that I'll never meet, but I know that they'll pick up your book and read it and, and be touched by it, and that's important. And, and if you ask me if that would happen to me, you know, 10 years ago, would I be hosting a radio show talking about this? I'd be like, you're crazy. That would never happen. You know, because I lived in L.A., I was kind of like, like you said in the book, a little self-centered and doing the whole thing and, you know, hanging out and just thinking, oh, the world revolves around me in L.A. and blah, blah, blah. And once you get cancer or know somebody who has cancer, it's like, oh, wait, there's more to life than just the world does not revolve around me. There's a lot more important things going on yeah, than, than I have seen. Yeah, that's a great point, because a point I want to make to your audience yes. is that we're all touched by cancer at some level. I had an aunt who passed away from cancer, and I was living on the other side of the country, so I wasn't there every day. I'm the perfect example of a guy who didn't know much about cancer, mm -hmm. didn't understand it, didn't know anything about chemo, uh, didn't know anything about tumors and the odds of fighting and how to win and all that. But I threw myself into it because a friend of mine was dying of cancer, so I knew that I had to get into it quickly. And I'm no hero. I did, every one of your listeners would have did the same thing that I did. Exactly. They would have said, yes, whatever you need, I'll jump in and do it. But then it's how, what did I get out of it? And what I got out of it was I was fortunate after something horrible happened where one of my best friends died. I was fortunate enough to tell this story in the handoff about what I witnessed when my mentor was dying. And I'm just happy I was able to tell this story. And it came out the way it did because... Other people can do this. Other people need to do this. If your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your friend, your neighbor ends up getting diagnosed with cancer, you have the ability to step up and do the right thing. Exactly. But you can't do that if you don't believe you can do it. You can't do it if you're scared or intimidated. And that's one of the other messages in the handoff. Just be ready. When someone calls on you, don't think twice. Just step up and do it. And then everything will take care of itself. 
Exactly. I agree. And that's what my uh, fiance did. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that caregivers are the unsung hero because, you know, you're always our cheerleader of, you know, when we're, when we lose our hair and when, you know, we're looking, uh, lose weight, like Andrew said, you know, I told people it was the best diet I ever had cancer, but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, you know, just like, just like Andrew had said. Um, but you know, you, you as well as a caregiver, you need a little encouragement from your friends. And I know you had that with your support system. Well, I had that from my wife and my wife was unbelievable. And she would watch me come back from these chemo sessions and I'd be able to sit down and have a little bit of dinner, but then I'd have to go to work. And what helped me along through this process was the fact that I had a job that I could go to every night and disappear for four or five hours on the radio and get away from all this about in the back of my mind. But work was my escape. I looked forward to stepping up and helping Andrew and being a chemo partner to him. But when I came home, I had a wife and two really young boys at the time who were six and four years old who needed their dad around to throw them and play catch and coach. And I was able to do that. I just put life, life on cruise control. I said, Mm -hmm. this is what I need to do, and we're going to do it. And fortunately, I was able to focus through it because I had a good support staff around me. But it's about the primary caregiver. Yes. A key here. Andrew's wife, Sandra, was the primary caregiver. When I would drop him off after chemo and he would go home, he was with his wife and his wife would have to deal with the late night vomiting, mm-hmm. the chills, depression, what was happening when he couldn't sleep, mm-hmm. uh, how scared he was at times. I wasn't there for any of that. The primary caregiver is the real hero. I was just someone in the process who was able to drive and to sit in on meetings and to be there for chemo and and talk encouragement. But I'm really blown away by the primary caregivers, the spouses, the partners who are there pretty much around the clock to assist. And, you know, the primary caregivers are also grateful for the chemo partners if they're not the same ones. Because, you know, you take a little bit of the... I don't want to say the, the pressure off, but they have somebody else to, uh, to be with. Because I know some, some people who have ke- uh, chemo partners, uh, they're also other cancer survivors. And, you know, you, like you said, you had a firsthand look of how Andrew interacted with other cancer survivors like that uh, gorilla, the gorilla story with the, the child. What was it gorilla strength? Yeah, let me tell yes. that story, the yes. story quickly. One of the days when we were in chemo, We were sitting there, and we were in a packed waiting room. I mean, absolutely packed. And I looked around, and Andrew saw a little boy who was sitting in the corner with his mom. And the boy couldn't have been more than 9, 10 years old. And his head was shaved, and he was getting ready for his name to be called to go in. And Andrew got up and walked across the room. And Andrew was a huge guy. He was 325 pounds, roughly. He looked – he was a cross between John Candy and Grizzly (laughs) Adams. Big guy. Loved to eat just a long blonde hair and a beard. And at that time, he was starting to lose weight. And he walked over to this little boy and got on his knee and introduced himself. And Andrew's nickname was the Gorilla because he was the King Kong of connecting people. (laughs) And he got on his knee to the little boy and he asked him what his favorite football team was. And they started talking football. And then Andrew said, give me your hand. And the little boy gave him his hand. And Andrew put his enormous hands around this little boy's hands. And he said, well, I'm going to give you all my Gorilla power. All the power inside me is coming into your body now. So when you get up and you walk into that chemo session, you have the courage because you're going to win because you have gorilla power. So they ended up calling the little boy's name, and the mom winked and smiled, and they went into chemo. And Andrew sat down next to me, and I said, wow, that was amazing. How did you do that? And he said, no, it's not amazing. I'm 49 years old. I can fight this. I know what's in front of me. That little boy doesn't. we got to help kids like that. And that was just one of the stories that I witnessed at City of Hope of Andrew Ashwood giving back to other people when other people were nervous and scared. And just something like that to somebody that you don't know or even somebody that you do know. I mean, I I think a lot of times people want to focus too much on the fact that you have cancer. And where you, you know, you, you would talk about sports on the way there and back. You don't have to talk about blood counts or, or if you're feeling nauseous or anything, because that's what we as survivors live with every day. You know, when I was going through treatment, everyone would be asking me, well, how are you feeling? It's like, I just want to know 
how you're doing with your boyfriend or, you know, did you go to the game last week? Or, you know, is your, did your car break down? Because the little minutia things of life that, that you may take for granted are things that I want to hear when I'm in the, the chemo bubble. That's a great point. That's very important. It's the normality of life. You yes. want to get back to the normality of day to day. You don't want to sit around and talk about cancer all the time. Imagine no. what Andrew Ashwood was going through as the vice president of Fox Sports Radio, where he had a staff of 40 or 50 people who all wanted to know how he was doing every day, all wanted to touch him and be a part of what was going on. All of his family, all of his friends, all the other guys like myself he mentored, every time those people got Andrew on the phone, they are, how you doing? Oh. How you feeling? Is it getting better? Are you going to win? And after a while, as a cancer patient, you don't want to talk about that. You want to talk about other people's lives. And exactly. Andrew was really great because, as you know in the book, his moniker, whenever he walked into a room, he would shout, yeah, babe. <laughs> that was his way of saying hello. He'd say, yeah, babe, and he'd connect people. And he loved putting people together. So even when he was going through his darkest days fighting this terminal cancer, he cared about other people. Mm -hmm. And that's what the handoff is all about. Live every day to your fullest take care of other people, and even if you're going through something really bad, you can help people along the way. He was great at that. Yeah, and and it's always amazing to me. Like, you never realize how much you have of that in you until something like this happens. Like, I've, I've done things for survivors that I've never met. I've tried to help people in different countries. And it's just like, if like you said, if you asked me this a couple of years ago before cancer, I'd be like, are you crazy? I'm not going to spend three hours on the computer trying to find something for somebody in Germany who's a cancer survivor that I've never met, just talked to on, on the internet. You know, it's, it's just doing, like you said, doing something for others because you realize that you have to, like you said, live each moment as if it was, well, it's your best moment, but also as if it's your last. Yeah, cancer survivors have a unique opportunity to pay it forward. Oh, yes. You know, there's a lot of people who don't survive cancer and they pass away, and it's very difficult and obviously they had a positive impact on so many people's lives, but I can't imagine what it's like for you. Mm -hmm. It's got to be humbling to know that because of the knowledge that you've gained for being a cancer survivor, you can help other people, and people need to hear your story because you survived this and you can help other people along the way. I mean, this is a community. This yes. is a large community, and cancer kills so many people, but the people who have been fortunate enough to survive – I believe, have the opportunity to help other people along the way and tell them what the battle is going to be about. Mm -hmm. This is a, a book about friendship, loyalty, but there's a lot of sports I love in sports. the book. And Andrew was a Packer fan. And Vince Lombardi, <laughs> arguably the greatest coach of all time, yes. had, a, had a mantra, winning is the only option. And we used that. We had T-shirts made up that said winning is the only option. We went on road trips while he was going through chemo and had a break with the attitude that winning is the only option. So you got to have things you look forward to. you got to exactly. have a game plan. You mm -hmm. have to have people around you who are pulling for you because it's a mental fight as well as a physical fight. Speaking of sports, how did you deal with your uh, producer, Bobby, who was a Red Sox fan and you're a Yankees fan? Oh, well, what happened there? I'm, I'm, I'm a Yankee fan, so I've been dealing with Red Sox fans my whole life. Fortunately, the Yankees have 26 World Series, so we're okay with the Red Sox because the Red Sox will never have the success of the Yankees. So when the Red Sox are successful, I let those Red Sox fans kind of uh, you know, sing from the highest mountaintop because it doesn't happen often. So I'm also a sports fan and a hockey player, and... I, I do have to ask you, and I know it's kind of off topic, but were you at Staples Center when they hoisted the Stanley Cup? So I'm a huge Kings fan and Red Wings I was fan. not there. You know, I'm on, I was on the radio, uh -huh. and that night we had all the guests and everybody on the ice to call into the show, and that was a huge deal. One of my good friends who I mentioned in the acknowledgments of the books, one of the greatest Kings who ever played, a guy by the name of Charlie Simmer, mm -hmm. and he played on their Triple Crown line, and I remember talking to him around that time, and you know, hockey's such a passionate sport, and I'm a little bit worried because it's kind of going away on sports radio. It's becoming more and more of a niche sport. But those L.A. King fans are diehard, and they were very patient over the years when the Kings, before Gretzky came and after Gretzky oh. came with all those years where they never won. That was a fan base that stuck with that team, and they deserved it when they finally won the Cup. Oh, it was such a great moment. And um, 
I don't know if you know, if you had time, because I know you're very busy reading the story about when I was di- diagnosed with cancer, uh, I was at the Red Wings training camp because they're up here in uh, Traverse City, Michigan. Sure. And um, I'd gone through uh, treatment and everything. And long story short, that was the year they won the cup, uh, 2007, 2008. And they hoisted the Stanley Cup banner uh, one year to the day of my surgery. So, you know, like like you said, bringing something, a passion that you love, as I love sports as, and as you do, into helping you uh, survive cancer and get through it is very important. No, that's great. I mean, you have, you have something that you're very passionate about. You're right. very passionate, I can tell in your voice about a lot of things but it was really nice that you were able to connect with hockey and have those goals set and those anniversary dates and remember that and very similar to Andrew Mm -hmm. Andrew was a diehard sports fan and he he lived the dream the key thing I wanted to tell you on this on this interview was yes Andrew lived the dream he lived every day to the fullest he changed so many lives and he was taken from us way too early but and a big butt, he made sure that he had a positive impact even to his last days. There was one last story where one of my coworkers was getting married. And this was about, this is at the end of the book when Mm -hmm. Andrew only had a couple of weeks left. And Andrew knew that he needed to go to this wedding because people needed to see him. And I remember when we pulled up to the wedding, my wife, Andrew's wife, me and Andrew, when we walked out, and we sat down at our seats at the wedding, and you could just see people in the room light up. And a lot of people knew that the end was near. Right. But Andrew was kind enough to sit and talk to 10, 15, 20 people one-on-one, some who probably thought they were saying goodbye. But he was selfless that day. He didn't want to interrupt the wedding. He didn't want to take away any of the energy from the bride that day, but he knew he needed to be there because people wanted to see him. Right, as, as did the bride and groom. Exactly. Wow. I mean, it's, Andrew sounds like a great person I would have liked to have a, a beer with and watch a game with. Well, it wouldn't have been <laughs> a beer. It would have been more than one beer. It would have been a couple of beers, a shot of tequila, <laughs> and some breakfast tacos and some chicken wings. And then suddenly and, there's a tiger in the bathroom, and then, you know, all hell breaks Exactly. Loose. <laughs> exactly. Well, JT, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you have a lot going on. Do you have any uh, upcoming things besides your uh, your book? That we want yeah, to talk well, I'm about on or? the book tour. We, yes. The book came out August 13th. And as you know, it's available at Amazon.com and Barnes and & Noble. And mm-hmm. I'm still going to be on the road. I got upcoming book signings in San Antonio, Milwaukee, my alma mater, Geneseo State University. So as I'm doing all this Raider work and I work for the Oakland Raiders of the NFL, I'm going to be on tour wow. about, this, about this book and the impact that my mentor had on me. So I hope we can do this again next year and talk about the success of the book. Absolutely. And do a follow-up interview because I'm really excited about the future. And do you have a, a website where people can look and see where, you're, uh, where you'll be signing books at? Yeah, everything's at foxsportsradio.com. Excellent. If you go to foxsportsradio.com and click on JT, all the information is there, the Buy the Book banner, excerpts from the book, the audio book, and uh, some, some of the information about my radio show, so you can find me there. Just a few radio shows you were on. Just a couple. Uh, I try to work until they <laughs> kick me. They're going to kick me off a of radio someday, so i got to keep working while, while they're letting me stay on. I imagine we were in, in L.A. at the same time, probably driving down uh, Ventura right by Sepulveda. Where, was that where you worked, Fox Sports Radio there? That's right where I worked in mm-hmm. that building, right across the street from the Galleria Mall. Yes. So, like I said, thank you so much, JT, for joining me today. Uh, If you hang on one second, I'm going to wrap up like I usually do. This is Mal Majoros. I'm the Cancer Warrior. You can always find me on Facebook because I am a Facebook junkie. Check out my blog, thecancerwarrior.blogspot.com. And as always, life looks pretty good from where I'm sitting. Sending you good vibes. It's the Cancer Warrior on EmpowerRadio.com.